In 1991, the sixth Nightmare on Elm Street movie came out, and it attempted to do the unthinkable, to kill off Freddy once and for all and send him back to hell. In Freddy's Dead, the final nightmare, which is a bizarre entry which takes a more comical, oddball humour approach, something that really itches the balls of many fans. This time, Freddy played once again with Menacing Delight by Robert Englund, is reunited with his long-lost adult daughter. But this family reunion is going to end in a showdown, where Freddy will finally be put to an end. So, the big question is, is it a spectacular finale, or a stale letdown? Well, that's up to the individual viewer to decide. I'M FREDDY, AND I'VE COME FOR YOUR SOUL! <laughs> no, just kidding, look, it's actually... MINTY! <laughs> or as I like to call this look, Minty Kruger. But seriously though, how cool is this mask? Look, it goes right down to the chest and shit. <laughs> Although, it is a little hard to breathe, but you know, it still looks cool. I actually got the idea of doing this cosplay from my friend, Cosplay Chris. Anyway, time to stop the little chit-chat. As we check it out, Mitch. Number 10, a time to focus on other movies. The first A Nightmare on Elm Street movie was released in 1984 and was directed by Wes Craven, and it was a massive success that put its distributor New Line Cinema on the map, earning it the nickname, The House That Freddy Built. Freddy would return for further sequels, where throughout the 80s, the popularity of the franchise would continue to grow, and Freddy would become a staple of pop culture. However, by 1989's A Nightmare on Elm Street 5, The Dream Child, it was felt that maybe the franchise had run out of steam, as it had a lower box office intake and wasn't exactly embraced by fans and critics at that time, leaving New Line Cinema to believe that maybe this series had run its course. So New Line Cinema decided to do the unthinkable, to finish Freddy off for good, to make a big spectacle movie that was going to be solely dedicated to the Dream Demon's demise. Another leading factor in this decision is New Line Cinema themselves were evolving as a movie company at that time. They were no longer just the company that made A Nightmare on Elm Street movies. At that time, they were having successes with other movies, like the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle movie. And around about this time, the studio was distributing other ambitious movies, like Drop Dead Fred and Lawnmower Man. As the company's founder, Robert Shea, puts it, it was time to move on, and we had other projects to focus on. Oh, I get it! Little New Line Cinema thought that it was all now grown up and didn't need Freddy! <laughs> so tell me, what were the box office returns for Drop Dead Fred and Lawnmower Man again? <laughs> Number 9, The Freddy Movie We Nearly Got so I guess the word was out on the grapevine within the New Line Cinema click that there was now talks of making one last Freddy Krueger movie, one that was going to kill him off. And no doubt there was probably several aspiring filmmakers with their own ideas of how to send Freddy to hell, permanently, once and for all. And one of those filmmakers was a young Peter Jackson, who wrote his own A Nightmare on Elm Street 6 script. The New Zealand director wrote a script about a group of teenagers who were fascinated with Freddy Krueger and no longer saw him as a threat, on the account that over the years he had weakened, where they took sleeping pills to enter Freddy's domain and pretty much beat the crap out of him to get their kicks. Where eventually I guess it doesn't quite go to plan. But, however, New Line Cinema didn't go with this ambitious script. But despite his Freddy script being rejected, Jackson would still go on to make his Lord of the Rings trilogy with the company, with Lord of the Rings The Return of the King becoming New Line Cinema's highest grossing movie. Number 8. A Change of Direction with the Title 
So it's here we get to Freddy's Dead's director, Rachel Talele, who in recent years would go on to direct many episodes of Doctor Who. Anyway, at that time, she had already worked on the previous Nightmare on Elm Street movies, where this time she was given an upgrade, where she became the movie's director, as well as coming up with the movie's story. She wanted to inject new life and new ideas into what may have been seen as a tired franchise at that stage. And one of these changes was to remove the title, A Nightmare on Elm Street. Yep, she didn't want to make A Nightmare on Elm Street 6, but wanted to spruce things up with a different title. One that hits home that this is Freddy's final curtain call. I see the logic. Each and every other movie starts with A Nightmare on Elm Street followed by a number. So this was different. Where this movie got the title, Freddy's Dead, The Final Nightmare. Yep, spoilers be damned. This title lets you know right away what you're in for. Freddy's gonna die. Enjoy the movie. However, and yes, I know how popular the word however is on YouTube, when the movie got a DVD release here in Australia, it was retitled to A Nightmare on Elm Street 6, Freddy's Dead, The Final Nightmare. Yeah, look at that. So why did they change the title? Well, because Freddy did return, making the previous title null and void. Number 7. The Cartoon Freddy Movie Okay, something I saw a few times when doing research for Freddy's Dead was it being referred to as the Looney Tunes Freddy movie. The Freddy movie that didn't so much feel like a violent horror movie anymore, but more like a comical cartoon. And I think that this is something that draws a lot of criticism with the movie. Adding more comedy, which was also an idea of Rachel Talalys. Once again, in an attempt to try something different, but also to steer away from A Nightmare on Elm Street Part 5, which was a darker entry in the franchise, and I think some people felt it did go a little bit morbid, with this entry taking more of a gothic horror approach, and dealing with themes like teenage pregnancy and eating disorders. Now when it comes to the humour in Freddy Krueger movies, there is a lot of nuances. Although the first two movies could have cheeky wink wink nudge nudge moments, they were serious horror movies. Three and four had more comical elements, and did make Freddy more humorous, and overall in general had an MTV vibe about them. But they were still horror movies. With those two movies, horror still came before the comedy. And I think that's where Freddy's Dead gets it wrong. It relied a little bit too much on comedy and cartoon violence, and it just wasn't really scary. Yeah, a Freddy movie without the fear factor. I think that when it gets to the stage that Freddy is dressed like the Wicked Witch from Wizard of Oz and is playing with a power glove, the goofball comedy approach may have gone too far, but that's just my opinion. Number 6. David Lynch and John Waters were inspirations. So yeah, there's no denying it, Freddy's Dead is one strange chapter in the franchise, what with its use of wacky comedy and more cartoonish approach with its violence. Something else that's been attributed to the movie's offbeat approach was Twin Peaks, which was being aired during the early days of Freddy's Dead's production. And I think you can see the Twin Peaks influence in the scenes where the characters enter Springwood, which does feel like a Lynchian surreal town. However, some of these strange scenes may feel like David Lynch, but you might also find that visually they look like something from a John Waters movie. Well, that's because the production also took inspiration from Waters' films Hairspray and Crybaby. In fact, according to several sources, a great deal of the crew from Crybaby were then subsequently brought in and used for Freddy's Dead. And in many ways, the movies do look alike, and supposedly even Divine was envisioned for a small role, that being the woman on the airplane. But sadly, Divine had already passed away at that stage. Number 5. Deleted Character The script for Freddy's Dead was written by Michael DeLuca, who produced the previous movie and would actually go on to work on many, many more movies. In the final film, the main character is Maggie Burrows, a youth counsellor played by Lisa Zane, who, yes, is the sister of Billy Zane. Where in the movie, there's the revelation that she's Freddy Krueger's daughter, which is an interesting direction. However, in a very early script, the main character was going to be Jacob Johnson, aka Alice's baby who she was pregnant with in the previous movie. Only he was now going to be 15 years old. And Alice was to return too, now in her 30s, and was to be killed off by Freddy. And the Dream Warriors themselves were going to return, and they were going to be known as the Dream Police. Oh my god, that sounds terrible. Where the Dream Police would team up with Joey to take down Freddy. 
but this version wasn't made as the production couldn't secure the return of Alice actress Lisa Cox. That, as supposedly Rachel Talali hated the script. <laughs> Can't say I blame her. And there are some fan theories that the John Doe character is Jacob all grown up. Yeah, when you think about it, that would actually make sense. And there actually is merit to that as we never find out who or what his identity is. Number four, the 3D Nightmare. So in probably another attempt to inject new life into the Tired series and to try something new, it was decided to make Freddy's Dead a 3D caper. Which is strange, as although the 3D gimmick did have a brief comeback in the mid-80s, with attempts like Jaws 3D, Amityville 3D, and Friday the 13th 3D, by the early 90s, it had somewhat fizzled out again. But regardless, it was decided to take this Freddy movie into the third dimension, making Freddy's Dead the first New Line Cinema picture to do so. But what's even more baffling is the 3D gimmick is only introduced into the movie's last 10 minutes. Now maybe I'm wrong, but that kind of makes it feel like this was a last minute afterthought to try and insert some punch into the movie, where we get the concept of Freddy Vision, where 3D glasses can be worn in the dream world. Now I've heard some people say that when the movie was shown in theaters, the 3D was pretty good, but I've heard others say that the effect was really lackluster to it being downright bad and apparently some audience members didn't even know when to put on the 3D glasses and completely missed out on the 3D effect. Yeah, when the Maggie character puts on her 3D glasses, that was apparently cue for the audience to put on their 3D glasses and a huge chunk of the audience didn't catch on to that. Now I can't pass comments on the movie's 3D effects because I've never seen them. But when released on VHS and further home medias as well as TV broadcasts, the 3D effect has been removed. Apart from the UK and French VHS rental versions, as well as the Laserdisc version and the 1999 box set which featured all the other movies. So you'll just have to track those down if you really want to see the movie's finale in 3D. In addition to that, according to Wikipedia, the company that was in charge of the movie's 3D conversion sent the production some test footage, but accidentally sent them footage from Terminator 2 Judgment Day, which hadn't even been released yet at that time. Whoops! <laughs> oh dear. Yeah, I'm sure James Cameron would have had a lot to say about that if he knew. <laughs> Number 3. Freddy's Dead Cameos Freddy's Dead features several appearances from well-known faces in either small cameos or minor roles, of which the Freddy franchise wasn't really known for having famous people randomly popping up in brief scenes here and there, but here we are. It sure does happen in Freddy's Dead. These include Alice Cooper, who plays Freddy's father, who took the part as he was a fan of the series. The movie's main song was performed by Iggy Pop, of which that song was nominated for a Razzie, but never mind, I guess. The legendary Yapfet Kotto was cast as the character Doc. He was kind of like an old wise mentor. I guess you could say kind of like this movie's Obi-Wan Kenobi. The movie also features Tom Arnold and Roseanne Barr, who were married at that time. But the most fascinating cameo is that of Johnny Depp, who previously starred as Glenn in the first movie. I guess this was to tie what was supposed to be the last movie to the first movie. And interestingly, he's credited as Oprah Noodle Mantra. Oprah Noodle Mantra. Oprah Noodle Mantra? Huh? I don't get it. Speaking of things randomly turning up, there's a scene where the Spencer character is playing a Game Boy. But if you look closely, that doesn't look like a Game Boy, but more like a white calculator. And the production thought, yep, that'll do. That looks Game Boy-ish enough. <laughs> Number two, a character switcheroo. So the first act of the movie focuses on the John Doe character, with it being believed that he is Freddy's offspring, till we get the twist reveal that it's the Maggie character. The part was played by Sean Greenblatt, and as his journey goes on, he is sent to a facility for troubled youths, where he meets other teenage characters, including Spencer, played by Brecken Mayer, Tracy, played by Leslie Deanne, and Carlos, played by Ricky Dean Logan. Now, Ricky Dean Logan, who played Carlos, originally was cast as the movie's pivotal role of John Doe, but as the production went on, he just felt like he gravitated more to the Carlos character. So, because of that, he was switched to the Carlos part. Leslie Deanne had an unfortunate incident while filming her fight scene with Freddy, 
when Robert Englund accidentally hit her on the head with the back of his glove, which led to a trip to the hospital, some stitches, and a tetanus shot. Good one, Freddy. What? Me? Uh, I didn't mean to. <laughs> And Final Nightmare is the first movie in the franchise to feature extended scenes of Robert Englund without his Freddy makeup. Yes, we've seen his face briefly before in minor scenes in previous movies, but here's an entire sequence of unburned Freddy showing the character before his boiler room burning. Number 1. Funeral for a Boogeyman so the everlasting defeat of Freddy Krueger was a big deal. At the time, this was considered the end of a character. The end of an era. This was it. Freddy was going to die. So naturally, New Line Cinema wanted to make a big event out of it, where a mock-up funeral was held for the character, which was attended by several cast and crew of the movies, including Rachel Talley. So in part, this funeral was done to get the word out there, there is no more Freddy. Spoilers, he returns three years later. So Freddy's Dead The Final Nightmare was released in September 1991, and it made just shy of $35 million on a budget that sat somewhere between $9 to $11 million. So it made some profit, and it actually made more in the box office than A Nightmare on Elm Street 5, and it actually had the highest opening weekend in the series at that time. That is until Freddy vs. Jason came out 13 years later. However, the movie was seen as a disappointment and was torn apart by critics and fans and is frequently described as being people's least favourite Freddy movie. Something that I think did not help the movie, as mentioned, was its wacky oddball humour and cartoonish violence. My issue is this, though. For a movie that promises to be an epic end to the Freddy saga, it really lacks momentum and spectacle, and if anything, it feels milder than your usual Elm Street movie. When I was a kid, Freddy's Dead was kind of known as the child-friendly Freddy movie, the one that your parents didn't mind you watching if it was on TV, as it wasn't as horrible as the other movies. Even Freddy's Burns makeup looks toned down this time and not as horrific, and it doesn't stand out as much as it usually does, almost looking like this might be a PG-13 Freddy Krueger. Look, I think they tried something different, and you have to commend Rachel Talley for throwing away the Nightmare on Elm Street handbook and going in a different direction. I think that takes a lot of guts, but I just think the direction it took was a little misguided. But that said, if you look at the movie like a cartoon or a comic book, it does have lots of fun. And as always, Robert Englund looks like he's having a ball. And the movie does have some interesting visuals and ideas. But it's my least favourite entry in the original series. But you know what? That's okay. One movie had to take that spot. But considering that Final Nightmare is very watchable, if this is Freddy at his worst, then it can't be all bad. It's kind of a popular trend to now kill off iconic characters in movies, like Han Solo, John Connor, and James Bond, etc, etc. It's a tired gimmick that has now been done to death. So when you think about it, Freddy's Dead was kind of ahead of the curve, as it already did that 30 odd years earlier. And Hollywood should have learned from Freddy's Dead that it just doesn't work, and can never live up to the momentum. Anyway, I'm Minty Kruger. I don't see you in your dreams! <laughs> oh! <laughs> oh.